and welcome to Amber Good News Is, a co-production of eight universities in seven countries, broadcasting from 16 time zones across the world. I'm Demay Williams. And I'm Amina Riley. We're here in our studio at Leeds Trinity University in the United Kingdom, and we're joined by our co-hosts from around the world. In Central Taiwan, I'm JC from the National Taiwan University of Sport, Taichung. I'm Julia Benavidi. And I am Felipe Simões from Metodista University of Sao Paulo in Sao Paulo, Brazil. I'm Laura Rollick and I'm Sam Tinejero. We are from Toronto Metropolitan University in Canada. I'm Victoria Petraszek from Breda University of Applied Sciences in the Netherlands. I'm Toby Ng and I'm Annie Chen at Hong Kong Baptist University in Hong Kong. During the show, we'll be exploring good news stories from all over the globe to bring light to what's become quite a negative world over the past few years. Our reporters have been searching far and wide for stories to show there is hope, warmth and humanity all around us. In this part, we'll be looking at the benefits of being around dogs, rescue animals and community projects that are making a real difference in the lives of so many. So let's go over to Victoria in the Netherlands to start us off. Thanks, Demaya, and hello from Greta. So in keeping with the theme of our prog program, we scouted the city to find out what good news means to people in here. Let's take a look. I'm Annika. And I'm Suus. And we're here at Breda University of Applied Sciences. And we're going to ask what the good news is. And the good news is... Online classes. And the good news is... That I'm not cycling 30 kilometers every day. And the good news is... That tomorrow's my big deadline. Uh, I used COVID time to actually do a study that I liked while also finishing my other study. So I had two screens in front of me. Two different teachers, two different languages. But yeah, I finished my one study and now I'm doing something that I actually love. Going out again. And the festivals. Legal parties are back. <laughs> nice. So that was a lot of good news. What is your good news? So my good news is actually that I went to a really nice holiday to Helsinki last summer. What's yours? Uh, my good news is that my birthday is tomorrow. Exciting! So we're signing off as Anneke Ehrens and Suus van der Ven. We're here at Breda University of Applied Sciences in Breda. So there you have it. Lots of good news in our fair city here in the Netherlands. Thanks, Victoria. And I think we can certainly echo those sentiments here in the UK. It's definitely good news. What's your good news, Demir? I think getting to host this show is good news. <laughs> what about you in Toronto? In Canada, we are so excited to be playing in the World Cup after 36 years. So we're really, really excited to support our team on the global stage. And the good news here in Canada is also that commuting in the morning has gotten a whole lot easier because construction is finally shutting down in the major streetcar routes. How about over there in Sao Paulo? In Brazil, the good news is that we have just been through with our election. And Luiz Lula Inácio da Silva, also known as Lula, has been elected the new president of Brazil. And with that, people expect improvements and hope for a new and better future. Yes, Julia. And with that being said, our future president, Lula, just participated a few days ago at the COP27, which stands for the Conference of the Convention on Climate Change. And since the Amazon is a world agenda, it brought the population a new sense of hope. What about Taiwan? In Taiwan, uh, our friend Japan, they won the soccer game. And also we have election in, uh, on Saturday. We are going to vote our mayor in each city. I would say my good news is that most of our COVID travel restrictions were lifted recently. Yes, and Hong Kong people can finally go on holidays aboard for the first time in more than two years. It's great to be here for this show. Well, thank you all for being part of this global broadcast. It's so good to have you all here. Now, there are a few things that can brighten your mood like dog cuddles after a rough day. Two recent studies published in the Science Journal, Plus One, show that there is scientific proof behind this phenomenon. Yes, watching, cuddling and generally just being around man's best friend apparently makes us more sociable. And dogs even have the power of sniffing out stress in humans. Our reporter Tuva Le Jean Clou didn't pause for long before jumping on this story. She's a loud player. <laughs> I'm a loud player. I just absolutely love my job. It's the best thing ever. Getting a pet just might be the solution to calm day-to-day -day anxieties and worries, research says. 
Elodie Bosco, owner of Pawsome Walks, decided to take on 25 dogs. I was very unhappy in my previous career. Um, I did love the job itself, but it was there was a lot of pressure from my customers, my um, my bosses. So I was I was very low when I decided to set up this business, and it's the best decision I ever made. I don't consider work work. It's fun. It's I used to be the kind of person where I used to be anxious on a Sunday evening at the idea of going to work on Monday morning. I don't have that anymore. I'm happy to go to work on Monday. Um, it's just it's just amazing. Elodie says she sees her work as a form of therapy. I feel like I get a bit of a, a double good therapy through my job, being with the dogs, exercising, being in the fresh air. You you sleep so well. You. It's amazing. <laughs> you jealous? I love you very much. You know that. Oh yeah. <laughs> Researchers hope studies around dogs' effect on mental health might lead to improving our knowledge about animal-assisted clinical therapy. I'm Tuvalu Anglu, Leeds Trinity University. And turning to our canine friends as a form of therapy seems to be a theme around the world, including here in Canada. Yes, it's that time of year when students are extra busy with their assignments and midterms. And here at Toronto Metropolitan University, the Therapy Dog Program helps students relieve stress by interacting with fluffy friends. Kelly Ho has that story. This is Ivana, a first-year student studying hospitality and tourism management, and she is patting Dasher the Whippet. Ivana comes here every week to hang out with fluffy friends, relieve stress, and make up for her childhood regrets of not having her own dog at home. I'm not allowed to have uh, dogs at home because my parents aren't really into that and it's a lot of work for them. I usually find that the day before TME therapy dogs, I'm like really excited to go see the dog so it kind of helps me forget about anything I'm really stressed about. Every week, a few volunteers from St. John Ambulance Therapy Dog Program show up at TMU with cute doggies to help students deal with anxiety during high-stress parts of the semester. Scott Kennedy is a long-term volunteer at St. John Ambulance. Hello, my name is uh, Scott Kennedy. My dog is Dasher. We volunteer with St. John Ambulance. We go to uh, universities to cheer the people up. Seeing a dog come in and being able to pet it really improves their day. Sadie and Andrew are students in TMU's Creative Industry Program. They say the Therapy Dogs Program has made their day by helping them forget about stress and homesickness. So I'm from BC and I left my dog at home. Um, so I've been really missing my dog. Coming here and like getting to like be with a dog made me feel like I was at home. And it's just a great way to de-stress and just get to spend some time with these cute dogs. And um, yeah, it's a great opportunity. They're right here. The TMU Therapy Dog Program has been successful for nine years. When student life gets busy and complicated, it's a chance to take a deep breath and relax. I am Kelly Ho at Toronto Metropolitan University. Here in Hong Kong, stray puppies and cats are finding new homes. A charity called Paul's United have been holding adoption days to find new owners for our furry friend. Wisha Limbooth reports. These puppies are waiting to find a new home. The adoption day is held by Paws United Charity, a nonprofit animal organization that aims at rehoming cats and dogs in Hong Kong. The government kennels rescues or takes in a lot of animals or we rescue from these uh, kennels. We, we trap and we neuter and we release certain dogs and the puppies, we usually take them in. <laughs> In 2019, Priyanka, who is now 21 years old, adopted a mongrel from Lifelong Protection Charity, also known as LAP, and named him Freedom. His litter means him and his siblings. They were thrown in a rubbish bin after they were born. So they found them in like Lama Island. It's pretty sad. Freedom over here is one of the many lucky dogs who got the chance to be adopted and found his forever home. He was adopted by Priyanka and her family three years ago. 
However, the same cannot be said for the many other dogs who are waiting for the same chance. Love Fluffy Home has been taking in more and more abandoned dogs during the pandemic. Some of the pet owners left Hong Kong and simply left their dogs behind. Some of the dogs are too old to travel as it would cost the owners too much money to fly them to another country. Jay is one of the fosters in Love Fluffy Home, who helps to train the puppies while they wait for a new home. CC is one of the many puppies here today waiting to be adopted at Love Fluffy Home's adoption day. Her mother was a stray dog who recently just gave birth to CC and her siblings. CC over here is just four weeks old. Paws United Charity has been set up since 2018. Over the years, it has successfully rehomed over 500 animals per year. The charity usually takes two to four weeks to rehome an animal. We shall end though in Hong Kong with that report. Now, sadly, there is a worldwide problem of abandoned animals, including here in Brazil. But in the UK, in recent years, animal shelters have received around 80,000 calls a year from people who want to adopt a pet. Yorkshire Rose Dog Rescue is just one of more than a thousand animal shelters in the UK. Alicia Whitehead went to see them. In the last decade, the pet population in the country has increased by 15 million. There are around 1,000 animal shelters in the UK. I spoke to Adele Robinson, who helps run the Yorkshire Rose Dog Rescue in Clepkeaton. The rescue, which is staffed entirely by volunteers, are determined to give every dog they can a second chance it deserves. Because there's just so many of them. Um, we The last few weeks we've been absolutely inundated with people wanting to give up the dogs because a lot of people got them in lockdown and they've not been socialised, they've not been taken out and they're all coming with problems so 18 months later all these dogs have got problems that the owners can't can't deal with so the stray pounds are full the rescues are full due to the high demand of dogs that come through the yorkshire rose dog rescues door more fosterers are needed to help care for these animals what tends to happen is people will foster a dog and end up keeping it so whilst you've found the dog at home, you've lost a fosterer, so... Whilst there's many people that are keen to foster dogs, there's many that ultimately end up adopting them. I'm Alicia Whitehead, a broadcast journalism student at Leeds Trinity University in Leeds. Up next, we'll be looking at heartwarming stories showing how the support from local communities can have a positive impact on the lives of those who need it the most. Here in Hong Kong, food banks have been stretched to the limit as more and more people have turned to them for help during the pandemic. But the good news is, some concerned groups have come up with a solution. Yes, they have come up with the idea of community fridges to encourage neighbours to help each other out. Warner has the story. This is one of 25 food sharing fridges in Hong Kong. Some are in shopping malls, some in restaurants and some even in schools. One white kid started the food sharing fridge project, Give and Take, a year ago to help people who lost their jobs during the pandemic. The idea is that people should only take what they need, but these fridges are not only feeding people, they are raising awareness in the need for a neighborly spirit. The project will collaborate with restaurants, among them Folk Heng Food Shop. The shop owner, Wang Sai Ling, finds the project helps to promote the idea of sharing. Food donors like Tam wishes that the public can share what they have through this project. We 
同社區人士一啲分享。Blue Fridge Project Initiator Ahmed Khan has seen an unprecedented phenomenon from homeless people。佢哋會望住唔敢攞。咁我都解釋俾聽，其實呢個係好似一個社區嘅雪櫃，就唔係話係邊個嘅。Although food sharing fridges are turning into a common feature to serve all the people in Hong Kong who need help to alleviate their life problems, the initiator of these food sharing fridges still wishing more people to actively joining them to spread love and positivity to all the people who need help in the community, and to make those people feel loved and cared by lending a hand to them. Warren Learn, the young reporter. What a great idea. I've never seen anything like that. Is there anything like that in the Netherlands, Victoria? Here in the Netherlands, we also have food banks where people can donate food for those in need. In the month of December, the food banks work extra hard to provide those in need with some food for the cold days and Christmas, of course. Now, here in the UK, there's a campaign to help out people who can't afford a winter coat. This autumn, the organisation Zero Waste Leads has for the second year held their winter coat appeal. Yes, people can donate their used coats, they then get passed on to those who can't afford their own, and it all helps to reduce waste. Marcus Erling Force went along to see how the donations are going. It's the second year in a row that Zero Waste Leads does their winter coat appeal, and Morley Leisure Centre is one of the 15 drop-off points around Leeds where people can donate their coats. Yeah, so uh, Zero Waste Leeds did this campaign last year um, as part of the Leeds School Uniform Exchange and uh, we managed to, to collect 500 coats and redistribute them across Leeds, so it was fairly successful. Um, and then Leeds City Council got in touch with us recently and said, we'd really like you to do it again, uh, but this time we'd like to, to include children and adult coats. They've increased the target from 500 to 2,000 coats this year but it's still unclear exactly who will receive them. So we're, we're working on that at the minute and we're going to redistribute them out to various hubs across Leeds. Um, like I say, we're working on finding out which areas really need the coats. Um, and also we've noticed that um, a lot of families, they're struggling with, with money at the moment, the cost of living crisis. Um, and whilst they'll make sure the children have coats, they might, might not necessarily get coats themselves. Uh, because they can't afford it, coats can be quite expensive. So that's why we've opened the appeal to include adult coats as well as children's coats so that we're covering all bases really. In the future they would like to continue and expand the appeal, but it all depends on funding and the amount of businesses who wants to help. Marcus Erlingforce, Leeds Trinity University in Morley. What a great idea for helping people out as well as upcycling unwanted coats. Now, community is very important across the globe, and that includes the UK. Woodhouse Community Centre has been in the heart of this in the north of England since 1975. It's a place that opens its door to all local residents. The idea is for people to go along, perhaps have a meal, and meet with others. Connor Darnbond went to discover exactly what the centre has been up to lately. The idea of the community centre was to get local people and residents from surrounding areas to start up their own projects, activities and ideas. I visited the centre to find out more. It's been really successful. Um, we've had lots and lots of different groups in the last year. Um, one of the ones that's been really successful is the, uh, the Lunch Club, which is a pay what you can cafe, which happens um, twice a week on Tuesday and Wednesday. Um, we've got some new groups starting at the moment. There is a currently a a crafts group um, which has been really successful. The people running it have decided to put a bid in for, for more money so they can start making it bigger um, and better and that's exactly what we hoped happen out of these um, these groups was they'd be taken completely to different levels we couldn't think about. The lunch club has been here for just over a year. The kitchen serves around 70 people per hour and it's so popular due to the wide variety of meals they serve. I started to save a lunch club to make myself happy and I thought that well if I can do something for the people then I'll make myself happy, I'll make them happy and the only thing I know to do is make good food. They come, they have a nice dinner, they meet some other people that they might not normally meet, socialise, talk about the problems, there's lots of other different aspects to this community centre that they can utilise. The centre is certainly benefiting people in this community 
I'm Conor Deerband from Woodhouse Community Centre, Leeds. That sounds like a great way of keeping, keeping communities connected and also a great idea to make some new friends. Don't you agree? Yeah, um, we've absolutely got something like that here in Toronto. Several community centres that donate clothing to refugees and newcomers. Now, when it comes to high school education, there can be a lot of barriers that students face, which may have an impact on their ability to graduate. All across Canada, Pathways to Education provides students in low-income communities with academic, finan academic, financial, and social support to help ease the burden. Taylor Scally from Toronto Metropolitan University has the story. Just being here is bringing back a lot of memories. I came here four times a week for the four years of high school. The leadership camp I got to attend, the endless hours spent getting help to perfect my English essays and applying to university, this place helped me a lot. One of the people who helped me most was Jasmine Snowden, my coach. I remember you being in Pathways, uh, always being at tutoring, always attending programming, which was great. As a matter of fact, I remember nominating you for one of our high attending students uh, for an award, so that was nice. Pathways is for students like me, who want to reach their full academic potential, but just need a little help. Thousands of students have attended the program over the years with 27 different locations across the country. Jack Bernacki is the manager at the Hamilton location. The goal of the Pathways to Education program is to increase the rate at which uh, young people graduate from high school in low-income communities and also to uh, ensure that they're able to make their post-secondary dreams come true, whether that's attending a college, a university, uh, doing some sort of skilled training, or to uh, making their way into the workforce. To achieve this goal, each student enrolled in the program has a coach who helps them with any challenges they may face throughout high school. As a Pathways to Education coach, my role is to support students through high school. So that means I um, help them to figure out their career path, I help them to get their volunteer hours, I help them to navigate the school system, figure out their credits, um, if there's any issues that come up at school. I advocate with teachers, with the school, whatever it takes to help a student to be successful through high school, I help with. Now that I'm finishing my degree, I can confidently say that Pathways commitment to student success is what helped get me here. Taylor Scally, Toronto Metropolitan University. That sounds like a great initiative. Now, here in the UK, November is a time to raise awareness of men's health. In Leeds, the Central Library has been playing their part by hosting Sound Mind. It's a festival which aims to show the benefits of music and movement can have for health and well-being. Throughout November, interactive sessions and musical performances have been open to the public. Our reporter, Izzy Redman, went down to have a look and talk to some of those involved. This week at Leeds Central Library, acclaimed rapper Testament hosted Being in the Moment, a musical event which used the work of Francis Steele to explore themes of mental health and mindfulness. Steele had been a large part of the music and literary scene in Leeds before sadly passing away earlier this year. So I thought, wow, this guy's, you know, same age as me, passed away before his art has got out and connected with anyone. Wouldn't it be great to like be in the centre of Leeds, the city he loves so much? and um, celebrate his work and connect it to people. Award-winning DJ Mike Howe wanted to take part in the event to honour his friend and open up discussions around mental health. My kind of connection in terms of the organising is like, hey, we're doing this thing, uh, it's about mental health, um, but we're going to be inspired by the work of Frank. Uh, Frank's work, we're going to be inspired by his work to kind of put this show on and he's like, sign me up. The event was part of a wider festival being held at Leeds Central Library throughout November called Sound Mind. The organiser Jamie Hutchinson spoke about the important events like these in supporting the community. Um, it's, but it's really important that we can open up dialogues with the community and the communities that we serve as a way of kind of you know exploring our art, exploring our history and our culturalness of the city. Tickets sold out to the show, which received great reviews from its audience. When they started singing and also that part where they asked us to choose a vote, I think that was good to get the public to interact a bit more. It's hoped the event will inspire conversations around mental health and encourage people to reach out for support. There's support and, and, and ways of, of uh, communicating it and also that creativity is a way of breaking through and finding, um, finding your way through and negotiating times when things are really 
anxious or depressing or hard. The festival continues at Leeds Central Library throughout November. Izzy Redmond in Leeds. Clearly, music is a great way of reaching people. In Brazilian culture, it's hugely important, and hip-hop is massively popular, especially among marginalized communities. The Educational and Cultural Association Passimente Zulu acts in over 58 countries. It promotes culture, sports, and social activities to groups of teenagers as an alternative to follow into violence and drugs. Since 1974, a non-governmental organization created by DJ Africa Bombata has been raising money as well as fighting against segregation. Pelas ruas da periferia de São Paulo, o rap e o hip hop criam vida, se tornando dois dos maiores gêneros musicais mais ouvidos no Brasil e no mundo. Um dos maiores nomes do cenário nacional é o rapper Antônio Luiz Júnior, conhecido como Rapping Hood. Ele fundou o projeto da Associação Cultural e Educacional Postmente Zulu, que visa em ensinar crianças e jovens sobre os fundamentos do hip hop, ministrando aulas de break dance, grafite e outros. O nosso projeto está aberto todos os dias, desenvolver oficinas dentro dos elementos do hip hop, DJ, MC, break, grafite, é... também ter uma rádio, ter um estúdio para que as pessoas possam desenvolver os seus talentos musicais e assim poder operar de forma gratuita para a comunidade, poder ser uma porta aberta para que esses talentos se encontrem. O hip hop e o rap já foram muito criminalizados por conta da origem marginalizada, mas conseguiram conquistar seu espaço como símbolos do combate à violência nas periferias e da luta contra o racismo. Eu posso dizer que fui salvo pelo hip hop, pelo rap e acredito piamente que muitos jovens nas periferias do país inteiro foram salvos também. E acredito que ainda há muito a ser feito. Quando eu comecei a fazer o rap, o hip hop, é, muitos chamavam de baderna, de bagunça, música de maloqueiros, mas na verdade é um estilo de música de mensagem, né? é uma honra poder fazer da música que me salvou a salvação de outros jovens em nosso país também. Para o rapper, fazer o trabalho de transformação social ajuda o próximo ao mesmo tempo que transforma a sua própria vida. Para saber mais ou ajudar, você consegue encontrar a Associação Cultural e Educacional Mentes Zulu no Instagram como Posse Mentes Zulu. Here in the UK, a Christian charity is working to provide support and opportunities for vulnerable people across the city of Leeds. It's called Caring for Life and is based at Crag House Farm, where it operates a non-profit restaurant, garden centre and farm shop. They also provide housing for the homeless and those at risk. Our reporter Josh Horsfield went to the site to find out more. On this small farm in the heart of the Leeds countryside, Christian charity Caring for Life are using this site to help support vulnerable people in the Leeds area. We spoke to Tim Parkinson, who tells us all about the charity. My name's Tim Parkinson. I'm the executive director of Caring for Life, which is a charity which is based in Leeds, in uh, North Leeds. It started about 36 years ago when my father, who at the time was a Baptist minister, uh, was presented with a need within the church that he was pastor of. So on the farm here, we do two things really. One is we provide daytime support to people who we support in the community. Uh, we've got a number of projects from horticulture to equestrian, agriculture, woodwork, music, art. We support people in design. Uh, we've got a computer and IT area. Um, catering, a whole range of projects where we can put people into and support them is very much a therapeutic area. Alongside the wonderful projects run by Caring for Life, Craghouse Farm hosts a number of social enterprises such as the garden nurseries, the farm shop, the restaurant and the little grab and go coffee shop. These help to bring funds that are desperately needed for the charity and also provide a place for people to go and learn more about what goes on in the community. We then found out what made Caring for Life so much different to other charities in the local area. Something that makes us slightly different to other things more locally is the spiritual dynamic. We are a Christian charity. As I mentioned earlier, it was born out of a church. 
Um, and at the very heart of what we do at Care and Fly, our motto is sharing the love of Jesus. We believe that there's a great example of a man there who loved people and actually loves people. And that's what we're all about. So we also include a spiritual support to people where you probably won't find that. So we really look holistically at a person and their need. I've been Josh Horsfield for Leeds Trinity University here at Crag House Farm. Over in the UK, community centres and projects have a huge impact on improving the lives of young people. Yes, despite the austerity measures affecting so many places in so many countries, there are a few community-led projects fighting against the challenging odds to continue changing the lives of young people one child at a time. Our UK reporter Mia Hager went to find out how this change is being made. Catch is a Leeds-based charity that has been working with the local community of Hare Hills for over 10 years. But they are not just a charity. Catch has become a safe space for young people and adults to get off of the streets and reach their full potential in a welcoming and friendly environment. People need to realise that Catch isn't just, you know, an organisation for members just to come in and take part in activities. I think they need to understand that catch is much more than that. It gives them an opportunity to, you know, prepare for the future, which is very rare. Like, okay, you members are given the opportunity to come during the day on a weekend to come and help out with the farm. Now, they, we don't tell them to do it. They do it from their own, like, you know, they volunteer to do it. And we appreciate that and we like to give them the opportunity because they feel proud of themselves, which is very important. Members can get involved in one of the many volunteer-led projects at Catch. Grow Together is a project that grows fresh food for the local community and the educational farm provides a unique opportunity for members to work with animals. I lead on the farm, so as you can see here, we have over I would say 50 raised beds where it has been built by young people for the community. We are planting here vegetables um, and once they are ready, uh, we collect them and we give out to the community. We also have over, no, we, we have 21 goats uh, where we, we look after them. Both are projects designed and built by their young volunteers. I'm Mia Hager from Leeds Trinity University in Hare Hills, Leeds. Food waste is a massive problem in many parts of the world. Over $230 billion worth of food is lost or wasted each year around the world. In Toronto alone, 2 billion pounds of food waste is produced each year. One small juice bar in Toronto is trying to combat this staggering statistic by reducing food waste, giving back to the community, and serving healthy smoothies at an affordable price. Rose Kim from Toronto Metropolitan University has a story. Brian is making a green smoothie, one of the many different types of smoothies that he makes at his stall, the Nutrition Bar in downtown Toronto, Canada. Customers love the Nutrition Bar for the fresh and healthy ingredients that go into their drinks. But Brian became concerned about the surplus of fruits and vegetables left over at the end of the day and had an idea. I decided because I have a lot of extra stuff around every day that I just put in a basket and give to whoever wants it. And I find that people are taking, taking are actually people with jobs, without jobs, with whatever. And, and um, I like the fact that it lives again through someone else. The Nutrition Bar is located in downtown Toronto an area where many people face homelessness or food insecurity due to rising food prices. In response, he's also involved in the Too Good To Go app, an app that directs people to restaurants that have leftover food to give away, another way to share his perfectly good leftover fruit and vegetables with people in need. It helps other people get the foods that we need, and the foods that we need are the fruits and vegetables. Those are really, I live on actually. Um, I would say 60, 70% of my diet are fruits and vegetables. Uh, I think that everybody should have at least 50, 60 percent more fruits and vegetables. So it's my way of being what to sort of push it out there and promote it. I'm promoting it all the time. I tell people, what do you eat? They tell me, I eat this, that, that. I said, you can eat more fruits and vegetables than I diet. Brian says he refills the basket several times a day. Although he knows this is not a permanent solution, he's playing a small part in helping people and setting a good example for other businesses to follow suit and do the same. Rose Kim. Toronto Metropolitan University. And Toronto isn't alone in this. Hong Kong throws away on average about 3,000 tons of food a day. 
That's according to government figures. Some local groups have come up with ways of making good use of unwanted food, not only to feed those in need, but also to change it into useful energy. Chloe Wong explains. It is midday at Hong Wen Cake Shop in Yunlong. They made about a thousand loaves of bread a day. Three times a week, volunteers will collect and then redistribute the leftovers. It's 7.30 in the evening on Thursday, a food giveaway day in Yunlong. Neighbors can bring their own bags to the station for the bread and cakes. Volunteers would repack the baked goods into plastic bags for those who are unable to come. They walk around to look for cleaners, the homeless or elderly who are scavenging for cardboards on the street. To ask if they need any bread or fruit. Right now, I'm at the Yunlong Children's Playground, which is the final destination of today's action. There are 221 big dead goods distributed to people like elderly and the homeless today, including bread, pastry, and fruits. As for food that is no longer good for human consumption, Eco Community Promotion Association Limited. Collects them in bins like this place all over the city. The unwanted food is turned into biogas energy to support an organic resources recovery center in Hong Kong. That in turn transfer the energy into electric grid to support up to 3,000 households. Now, some good news for people struggling because of cost of living crisis. A brewing house in the UK has opened its doors to people working from home. The tap room near Leeds is giving people a warm place to work so they don't have to turn on the heating at home. Charlotte Sennon reports. It is in the town of Auschwitz, near to Leeds in the Yorkshire, that we can find the Auschwitz Brewery. Since the beginning of October, the owner, Mark Costello, has opened a workspace in the tape room of his pub, the goal helping people during this period of cost of living crisis. I've basically realised that you know, people are going to be working from home quite a lot. I've got a partner who works from home and with the heating bills going up so much, so I figured we can help out the local community a little bit and get them working here it doesn't cost us anything you know we we definitely said that there's no customer service with it you basically you come you work you help yourself to your coffee and tea and water and what have you and save people potentially a substantial amount of money this room on yours during the day is therefore become an available and free workspace. Mark has had this idea on the Saturday and the next Tuesday the tape room was able to welcome its first workers. For coming, you just must send a message to the Auschwitz Brewery on social media. Its accessibility is one of the advantages of this workspace. But what is the greatest advantage? I think the fact it's free, we've got free Wi-Fi, um, it's, you know, it's warm. I think that's the main advantage of it and certainly at the moment as well it's quite quiet. It is a workspace, it's not a social space until we open. When we open at four, it's a social space. But um, you know, I don't want to be chatting with people if I'm working here, I, I, I want to work. That's what I'm here to do. Free Wi-Fi, quiet and warm space and after work, a place where we can relax, drink a beer and enjoy your evening with one of the many events organised by the pub. A great thing to overcome the actual crisis. I'm Charlotte Snow from Leeds City University in England. I can say keeping warm is a problem here in Taiwan. Luckily, that's all from me in central Taiwan where it's already quite late. But stay with us for part two. Y yes, there's still plenty more to come. We'll be finding out more about cultures around the world and also hear about the kindness of strangers. I'm Laura Rollick. And I'm Sam Tinajero here in Toronto. We'll be heading over... We'll be handing it over to our colleagues, so it's goodbye from us. And we're leaving now as well, but you'll be joined by Roxy and Ben. 
Stay tuned and the good news is returns in a moment. <laughs> 